Okay, so we're going to officially get started then. <laughs> so, um, welcome everybody. Uh, so I got a lot of new stuff. Oh, yeah, another existing student. Cool. You, no, I'm pointing to you in the back. I recognize you. <laughs> That's good. Um, come on in if you're here for software engineering. Software engineering one. How many people took the software engineering two course? I know you did. You did. Okay. So you're doing it in backward order, but you can still take software engineering one. It's an entirely different course. A totally different focus. It's not like the two, so it doesn't really matter which one you take first. One is going to be more of the foundational material. Two is a lot of applied software engineering. Uh, but for those of you who didn't take it last term, you have no, no issues at all. Um, so, or no questions about it either. But it, that's usually the first question people ask is, how is the one different from the two? And am I taking the right class and really, should I be taking this class? So yes, you should be taking this class, so sit still. and. Um, so I have a lot of like routine stuff I have to go over uh, for new people because sometimes I mean a lot of you are sitting here are the, you're here for the first time uh, so existing people are probably gonna be a little bored but we'll go through some new stuff uh, first of all my name is Barbara Hecker and uh, I have a website called behecker.com so www.behecker.com I put all of the course materials for all of my classes on this website and I also record every one of my lectures and the recordings of the lectures go on a YouTube site um, and you'll see a link in fact if I go into one of these classes uh, let's say from last term as an example this is what the independent study link is all about um, actually let me back up for a second and explain that so you'll see summer 2011 out here and for summer 2011 what we've got uh, are the four classes that I'm teaching this summer you're in the software engineering weekend section, meets three times during the semester, and I put the dates on here for you. If the dates change, something happens, it'll always be reflected on here, hopefully. Um, and the TA should be sending out email messages to everybody the week prior. However, some people don't get on the email list, and some people don't get in the EMS for a while, especially brand new people. It takes you usually a couple weeks or so at the beginning of the term. Uh, so you don't have to worry. You can get everything you need here. You don't actually have to have access to the EMS. So all of the assignments, all of the syllabus, which I'm going to go over in a few minutes, the course structure, everything you need for the course is on this website. And uh, <clears throat> in order to submit assignments, you'll have to upload them into the ITO EMS. Um, however, you won't have to submit, actually for this particular class, you won't have to submit anything until the midterm, uh, which is not going to be until the next class session. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. There is a final exam that's taken in class at the very last weekend. So you'll have a scheduled time the very last weekend of this course to take the final exam. You do have to show up for that uh, in person. Um, but uh, everything else you can kind of work on remotely because you sort of are working remotely. If you think about it, you're only here for three weekends out of the entire semester. So. Um, a lot of the work you are doing remotely. Um, and so I, it's probably not a bad idea to mention my email address as well. It's bhecker.itu.edu. Excuse me, at bhecker at itu.edu. Excellent way of reaching me, very responsive. I've got it on my Galaxy tab. I've got it on my G phone, my Android phone. I got it on my computer. I even have it on my TV set. It actually pops up uh, because my TV set runs through the Internet. So. I got it everywhere. That's the best way to reach me. If you try to call me, I never answer the phone because I'm always like in a class or something. I'm not going to go, hey, wait a minute, got to answer my phone. Instead, I just throughout the day constantly emails get pushed at me. So that's the best way of actually of reaching me. Um, and so as I mentioned before, what we're looking at here is uh, this class link which says Software Engineering 1. And uh, weekday and weekend sections are identical. So the assignments, everything will be the same. And as I mentioned <clears throat> right in the beginning, I record the, the lectures. So what you're getting is an audio recording of what I'm saying, plus you're getting the video recording that's on my screen, that's on the computer here. So you're going to see everything. So if you happen to miss a class session or something, um, you'll be able to catch up on everything as if you were sitting here. Um, also, what you do is you, have, you also have privilege to see what's happening during the weekday class. The weekday classes I go lecture by lecture every week because it meets once a week for a couple of hours or so and you know and then I record each lecture individually. Um, so you'll see lecture one, lecture two, lecture three, 
this one you're going to see weekend one, weekend two, week, but I'm going to cover a lot of stuff today. It's not going to be broken out as well as the weekly stuff. So you actually have an advantage because you can actually kind of peek in on the weekday stuff and attend either one, actually, if you want it, essentially by watching the videos. Um, so, but your attendance requirement is for this class. So, but, you know, some students want a little bit more information on a particular topic, you know, which lecture number it is, everything's numbered. And speaking of that, if you go into the course, uh, course, uh, course materials box and you look at the lectures, you see all of the PowerPoint lectures that you'll see. Um, after today, there'll be a new link here that'll say video lectures. Uh, so you'll be able to see not only lectures, but underneath it'll say video lectures. We have project files, design examples, and things, and I'll go through that in a few minutes. And this lovely little note here, it says class notes on it. That's a 166-page document. I'll go over that in a few minutes today. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of cover the syllabus, cover the class notes, cover everything you need to know to be successful in this course. Uh, going back to what I mentioned before, this little independent study list is a list of all of the other classes I've ever taught here. Um, and so what I was going to do is show you kind of like what the video lectures sort of look like. Uh, last term I uh, taught, uh, well let's just go into strategic management of information technology just as an example. The link in here will be under course materials and uh, in here we have live video recording. So if you click on the links, it actually takes you to a YouTube site, YouTube site, which is BJ Hecker. Uh, okay, so you, let's get started. Oops, now it's gonna. Um, the class is oops, starting. Let, let me <laughs> mute myself. Uh, so you'll see all of the PowerPoints and all of the lectures on the YouTube site, which is BJ Hecker. Jace, my middle name, Jill. Um, so. I couldn't get, I mean, I really wanted to get B. Hecker on the YouTube, but it was taken. So, uh, unfortunately, I have B.J. Hecker, which is not too bad, I guess, but I'm not changing everything else to match it. Uh, so that's basically what you're going to see in terms of our class when it's populated each week. It actually changes. Uh, the course structure is not going to change, but I keep adding, I'll keep adding stuff to this particular section. In fact, as another example, I'll add to this also, you know, final exam review. Because what ends up happening for this particular class is we only meet three times during the term. So our midterm will be due perhaps, you know, in the months the scheduling. And you can, it's the same midterm as the weekday class, same final exam as the weekday class. So you can look at their review lecture as well as your review lecture, things of that nature. And then I put the documents out here, the midterm will be a take-home midterm, it won't be an in-class midterm, but I'll, I'll go over that in a few minutes as well. Um, but this is how you're going to navigate through the course and how you're going to find everything that you need, hopefully. Any questions before I move on to the syllabus? No? Okay, very good. Are you guys all excited to be here today <laughs> for software engineering? <clears throat> all right, so let's talk a little bit about software engineering. Uh, for a bit. Uh, what are you going to learn in this class? Well, the class focuses, and I'm going to stand over here so I don't stand in front of the screen. I used to actually, then I just recently realized when I stand in front of the projector, people look at me funny. They're like, you know, they're moving their head over to right and left. I'm like, oh, that's what the problem is. They stand to the right or to the left of it. And then I notice I have to look this way in order for my audio to be recorded properly as well. So it's still work in progress. I'm still learning how to record stuff. So you got to bear with me a little bit on a social interaction or something. I don't know what you call it. But um, all right, let's talk about software engineering. Uh, as I originally started out saying, if you took the two and you're taking the one, no biggie. Completely different course. So in software engineering two, we focused on risk management, estimating project costs. These were really, they were a lot of advanced topics. In software engineering one, we start from the bare bones basics of software development life cycles, the development processes, models, system models, conceptual models, um, the deliverables, the items that are associated with um, the development of a, you know, from anywhere from a year to a two year type of project. So the focus is on the development of large software projects. Not small stuff. So it's not a programming course. There's absolutely no programming involved. And there's no, I wouldn't call it a computer science oriented course either. It's a kind of a hybrid of a business course 
and a computer course, sort of, but uh, um, not really like a hands-on, I should say. It's a lot of writing, but it's in documentation, not source code. In fact, you won't have to write anything for this particular course. That's another question students usually ask me, is, well, what language is it going to be in? There's no, there's no programming in this course. So. so what we're looking at are the techniques, and you can read through the description of your own, and I downloaded the syllabus from the behacker.com website. Give it a maybe three or four weeks or so, and the ITU EMS will be populated with this identical information. It doesn't really matter where you look at it from at this point. So, You can read through the description and the course uh, objectives. usually bores a bunch of people. They really want to know about the grading, or they really want to know about what we have to do for this course. It's generally the point. Um, there is an interesting distinction, though, between this course and the Software Engineering 2, if you just came out of that one. This one's project-based. Ah. So there's a huge project that counts for 70% of your grade in the course. And it's a group project, uh, which is why I'm glad some of the new students showed up, because you guys can select group members today. And uh, during the first break, you can kind of talk amongst yourselves and see who wants to work with who. And a lot of people don't know each other, especially if you live in New York, New Jersey, or all over the world. It's hard to pick teammates. And if that's the case, you can work by yourself. It just means you have to do everything on your own. Uh, but a lot of students, you know, if you work in a group of uh, four, five students, five is almost a bit too much. Four is the optimal size. Three is not enough. Uh, if you got, like, a group of four or so, uh, you can split the work out makes the, your life a lot easier throughout the course. However, it does require a little communication with the group members, but it actually kind of gives you a more real life kind of software engineering development project because software engineers don't live on islands of their own. <laughs> they, they work with other engineers and project teams, and there's a lot of project management, there's a lot of development life cycle management, there's a lot of planning, forecasting, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it that's really business kind of oriented, but you really need a team with a lot of different kinds of thinking environments going on in order to really simulate. But this course is a simulation of what actually happens, hopefully, which is the objective of the course. So a group project gives you hands-on experience developing uh, software requirements, specification, working through prototypes, and I'll go through all the deliverables that you'll have to put together. There is a book. Uh, there's actually a couple of different books I'd recommend. There is no required, this is required materials. I probably should say recommended materials. It's not necessarily required. Uh, this particular one, though, is uh, the software engineering and engineering approach. There's software engineering a practitioner's approach, uh, which is the one I actually kind of use for software engineering, too that uh, it may or may not be a good or bad choice. In fact, what ends up happening is students look for stuff when they need it on the Internet. There's a ton of software engineering books out there. In fact, this particular one, I didn't put the edition number on there, but I think it's like eight or nine editions so far, which means you can probably, if you're interested, this is the first course you've ever taken in software engineering and you're a business student, and you got your MBA, or you get not an MBA, you got a business bachelor's degree or something, or I don't know, you're... You're working on your second master's in engineering, and you're not you're coming from healthcare management or something. You might want to get a book because a lot of students feel more comfortable with a book. Uh, but what I've actually have also done is I have pieces of a book that have never been published before that's put together. That's in what I call software engineering notes. And then I'm going to show you that it's kind of a replacement for the book as well. But none of the assignments, none of anything comes out of this particular book. It is just, uh, in fact, uh, scratch that word required. It's not required. It's just a recommendation. Um, if you're curious, if you want a book for the course, that's the one I would refer you to, but not a requirement. Uh, grading scale formula is pretty normal. It's what you normally expect. I don't give out A pluses. A is the highest grade you can get in my class, 100%. It's 4.0, and the A, how, yeah, A pluses, you can't get anything above a 4.0. Why do we have a plus? But the... Uh, some instructors give out pluses, some of them give out A's. I mean, if you get an A or if you get an A+, plus, it's the same amount of points. So that doesn't count for anything. It doesn't give you 4.1 or 4.2, <laughs> which you'd think the purpose of the plus. But there's B-pluses and A-minuses. That reflects great points. 
but the solid grades don't normally do that, but anyway. All right, so let's take a look here. Up, oh, I misquoted already. Individual work is 45%, group work is 55%. Uh, so let's take a look at what's going on in this course. It's broken out, good percentage, 55%, over half, is that project. Sometimes I gear it 70, 30. This, it looks like the, well, I modified this a couple weeks ago. I forgot that I modified it actually to balance a little bit uh, because I needed to give more weight to final exam, midterm exam, CSLOs, and stuff like that. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but we have a group work, which is one, two, three, four, mm, four deliverables. We're not going to do the presentations. I probably should have edited that to take that out. But the people who aren't here can stress over it because they haven't seen it yet. So don't worry, you're not going to have to present your prototype. Uh, unless you want to, and you can. You have that option, actually. And if you want to, you'll get five points extra credit. That's, what that is, how that works. So if you think your team has been dysfunctional and your deliverables aren't really that good, and you want to get five extra credit points, that 5% that's allocated for class demo you'll get. Otherwise, it will get, we're gonna, I'm going to round average the score out, so it's really 90. I'm recording it. I'm re you don't have to. I can give you the file when I'm done, if you'd like. Okay. Um, so what we've got uh, then is a, a requirement specification. These are all documents or Word files that you'll be putting together. You don't need to buy any software for this course. Everything can be done in Microsoft Word. Um, you might have software tools like Visio that might come in handy for charts and things, and I'll go through, not till the second class meeting probably, uh, entity relationship diagrams, data flow diagrams, because you'll be working on your requirements for the first part, and I'll talk about that today. Um, analysis document, design specification or design documents, these are all documents, and the prototype is just a prototype, it's not a program. I have had students in the past skip all of the deliverables. Not deliver, not produce a requirements, not produce an analysis, not produce a design, but write a software program and turn that in. It's not, that's not what I want. <laughs> you can't take a recycle of program that you wrote for another class or for a project at a CPT training or something that you're going to take and turn in. Uh, no. In fact, the prototype, I highly encourage you to use uh, like non-programming tools for the prototype. It's not an active prototype. I'll talk about prototyping in the second class meeting. Prototyping is more along the lines of a PowerPoint presentation. It's more lines of a drawing some pictures, some mock-up screen interfaces or something. Uh, I'm not looking for a fully functional program. You're not writing that this summer. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Uh, but the point breakdown is uh, only 5% for the first deliverable. Uh, 15, 15, 15, you know, analysis, design. And I'll go through what these documents are uh, in the first lecture, actually. Uh, and then the individual work, what we have is a midterm, a final, and this thing called a CSLO essay. CSLO essay is worth 25%. Uh, midterm and final are only 10%. The only item on this list that is in class is the final exam. All of these or others will be activities that you'll perform. Um, the CSLO... Um, you guys probably aren't familiar with if you're brand new. It's called a Course Student Learning Objective, and it's, it's an essay. It's a writing assignment that you'll be doing. It'll be different for most of your classes. For my class, I have you write like a small paper, two or three pages long, something related to software engineering uh, that um, I'll announce. And in fact, I'll just, you know, on the bhacker.com website, I'll put up the CSLO description, assignment description so that you'll have it. It's not due until the very last day of class. In fact, none of this stuff is due until the very last week of class. Because some of you are like, panicking and going, I don't have EMS access yet. I have to submit everything to this system that I don't even have an access for. Like, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. <laughs> so, sometime before the end of the term, you're going to want to upload everything. And hopefully you're not going to wait till the very last day or the very last week. Because what ended up happening in the spring term is that the EMS went down because it got overloaded. It couldn't load balance correctly. Now they've upgraded it and actually fixed the problem, I think. So, Fortunately for you guys, all the bugs have been worked out of the system, hopefully. Uh, maybe, maybe for the new people. 
aren't familiar with any of the uh, growing pains of uh, the existing EMS system. Actually, from what I heard, it's being totally redone. So we'll see. I don't know if it's going to come out this term. No, it probably won't be introduced till the fall, but we'll see. Um, so we have that uh, breakout, and uh, these deliverables probably aren't going to make any sense to you, but as we go through, as I go through the lectures and stuff, I'll tell you this is the requirements document. And in fact, the course notes, which I'll go over in a few minutes, has everything laid out for you. It has templates of these documents, so you can see what you're supposed to be putting together. And uh, grading formula, the group gets a group grade. Everyone in the group will receive the same grade. I have this thing called a peer evaluation. And uh, there's also a document called a quality control document. It basically tells me who did what. It's kind of a checkpoint for your groups to make sure that you're reporting. So one guy doesn't, here's what ends up happening, one guy does all the work, and then five other people piggyback on him, which is why you can't have a group more than five to begin with. It's not going to be approved. Because uh, why would you have what, I don't know, we're probably going to have like 60 people in this class, so one group with 60 people. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody piggybacking for 55% of your grade wouldn't really be fair. So, what we've done is kind of put together these two forms, and they're actually on the website. They're in the supporting document area. If I go back to uh, software engineering here, and uh, you don't really have to, there's no grade associated with either one of these two, but they're in the team project files. We have a peer review form and a quality control sheet. Peer review form, let me just open that up real quick here. It's just an opportunity to evaluate how well your team members worked with each other. Oops, it's kind of small. Let's make it a little bigger. Ah, uh, let's see. There we go. So you got uh, yourself, you're going to rate yourself and up to four other people. If you don't have four, if you only have three other people, that's fine. And you're just giving yourself a score. Uh, what is this? One to three. On uh, whether or not they uh, leadership, collaboration, work quality, dependability, attitude. Uh, you're just grading them, essentially. Tells me how well the team worked together and kind of hopefully gives you the idea that, yeah, you should be working together, hopefully. And then the, uh, the quality control sheet is what you turn in with each one of your deliverable items. And that's, oh, this is good. That's just basically telling you what work was completed by who. Uh, so you can print these out, fill them in by hand. Uh, you can fill them out electronically. You just include it along with the document that you're sending in, that you're posting to the EMS. And what, how the EMS works is you can't actually like type stuff in there. You upload files. So and you can upload, uh, you know, you can put it all together in a zip file. And say this is my deliverable number one. It's my requirement spec and my quality assurance sheet. And then I'll have another spot in the uh, EMS where at the end of the course is when you do the peer evaluation. So you turn that one in once. And you turn the quality control in for every one of your documents. And there's only three documents. So actually four. You can turn it in if you want for the prototype. It's an optional kind of thing as well. Uh, so if you don't want to do it, you say, oh, the group's working just fan fantastic. This group of 60 people. Everybody knows who everybody is and everyone's working fantastic together, we don't want to turn this in. Usually there's one in the crowd that wants to turn it in, and they'll do it themselves, probably. But um, we'll have an interesting kind of thing, so I'll have to basically figure out who's working with who, and then you guys have to double up, like everyone has to turn it in. So otherwise I'm not going to know who's, you know, if you don't turn something in, it's going to look empty. But I, I'm on so-and-so's team. And then if it's not written on your cover page or something, and I forget. So everybody will have to, everybody in the team will have to do the identical upload of the identical file, which means at least you'll have to correspond with each other to all get the final copy of the requirement spec or the design document, stuff like that, so that you can all turn it in. So. Instead of one person turning it in, doing all the work, and everybody else saying, hey, I'm on that so-and-so's team. <laughs> And I'm like, uh, and then you ask so and so, and they're like, who's he? I don't know who he is. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, any questions about the grading, about the activities? Probably not yet until you start looking at it. <laughs> Let's talk about this team project a little bit more. And uh, so, what do we got? What do we got? We have a software solution. So, what you're going to do today 
It was great that we had new people that showed up. You're going to talk amongst yourselves at one of maybe the first or second break or so. Figure out if any of you guys want to work together. Because you guys actually showed up, which is good. Because you'll probably be responsible enough to actually be functional in a team, hopefully. In fact, we've got one, two, three, four. Actually, all six of you. Well, we've got one, two. We've got two in the back here. Six. Looks like two teams, actually. We could probably put two, two teams together. Or three teams together. Uh, the people here. Um, so first thing you're going to do is you're going to send me an email message and say, uh, the six of us, the three of us, or the four of us want to work together. Here's our names. And here's our group. And here's what we're going to do. And that's where the hard part comes in. It's like, well, what are we going to do? All right, so I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. <laughs> so, you're going to build a software program. So you're going, I thought you said there's no programming in this course. <laughs> there isn't any programming in this course. But throughout the next uh, 15 weeks or so, you're going to develop the everything but the source code for a software development project that's going to take one to two years to complete. And some of you are like, how do you know how many years is it going to take? If you took the Software Engineering 2 course, you probably can figure that out already. <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, so, you're going to have to pick a topic as a team. Some typical topics that people have picked. I don't know if I have that down here. Uh, no, I took it off because people kept using those topics over and over again. They got boring. Some typical topics that you might select what might be a university registration system, um, a banking system, a retail store system. You don't want to build an application like a shopping cart. Uh, the shopping cart is going to be like a program. What you want to do is build a system because you want to have more than one component. Um, you don't actually have to know anything about the system, whether or not you want to do a client server or a peer to peer or distributed type system. Or, you don't have to know anything about the details of how you're going to implement it. All you have to do is come up with a theme for your first kind of, you know, first take on this whole thing. So let's say you're going to build a student registration system. Let's say you're going to, well, let's say you're going to build another EMS. You're going to build your own EMS. And what you do in the description is you just talk about, well, we're going to build a new EMS. And uh, the new EMS is going to have these features. It's going to have the ability to add and drop courses, register for courses, pay tuition. In fact, that'd be nice, actually. Uh, I don't think ITU has a system that does that yet. In fact, you can design the new EMS system for ITU. Uh, student registration system or something. I don't know. And you can list out a couple of features that it has and just describe in a paragraph or so. It's not a graded assignment. It's just a... Uh, then I can reply back and say, Oh, that sounds like a good project. And if you send me something that says, I'm going to build Microsoft Word. Uh, no. Not a system. So you want to develop a system that's going to have hardware, software, but you don't have to know what. So something big that would take a couple years. Um, it can be a total software system. It doesn't have to have any hardware associated with it. So you could say, I want to build a new version of Microsoft Office. That would, that would be good because it has more than one component. Because what you need to do is design the system. And if it's just Word, unless you went into a lot of design about all the features of Microsoft Word, it's going to be kind of trivial. So the bigger, the better, which is kind of counterintuitive to what most students think. They think, oh, let me just pick something easy. They try to you know, Most students are going to go for the easy project idea. Are you going to overly compl complicate your life with picking a topic that, you know, you get your choice. Why pick something hard, right? Interesting thing is it's the opposite. The harder the topic, the easier it is to produce it, believe it or not, because you're going to be going through an entire development uh, process following a software development life cycle that I'm going to talk about today. From requirements, you're going to analyze the requirements, you're going to create a design specification out of that, you're going to create a prototype out of that. you got to have something to work with. <laughs> if you pick something too simple, you have nothing. It's harder to put it together, is what I'm saying. Uh, so think big. In fact, it could make more than two years. To I mean, it could take more than two years to build your system. Take five years, you know. Uh, a new Facebook or something. Uh, I'm facing about one or two years, I would say. And to realistically build it from scratch, you know, a new eBay or something. Uh, so you could think of a you could think of a software program. It doesn't have to run on the internet. It could be an embedded device. It could be 
anything you want, sky's the limit. Uh, so that's usually the hardest problem for the groups is to figure out what the theme is. And then sometimes you might change your theme halfway through the course, which is an issue. Uh, which is why everyone who forms a group today should exchange email addresses. <laughs> because that way you can communicate after this weekend. Uh, so. All right, so uh, software solution is what you're working with in terms of the project. I talked about the peer evaluation form, guidelines for writing. You can read through all of this stuff on your own. Academic integrity is important. Um, you'll get zero credit if you turn something in that somebody else has done. Um, lucky for you, you guys, mostly you're new students, so you don't know. Any, hopefully you don't know anybody who's done this course before. Although it has been a while since the last time I taught in here. Uh, so... Maybe you won't be recycling somebody else's work. The other thing, too, is it's also kind of easy to tell when you cut and paste off the internet for this course because I'm giving you a format for the requ I'm giving you a format for all of the different deliverables. It's going to be different than what you see on the internet because you're doing an entire two year project in the course of about 10 weeks, 12 weeks max, you know, m amongst other things that you're doing. You're not going to be putting together a full fledged something that you'd be copying off of the internet. <laughs> There's definitely a way of telling whether or not it was original or whether or not it was photocopied. Cut and pasted, I guess. So, so just make sure that it is original, created by you. And, uh, we don't have to worry about academic dishonesty or anything. Uh, let's take a look at the schedule. Here's the course schedule and assignment due date. And you're wondering, well, we only meet three times a week. Uh, three times a year. Or three times a term, I should say. Uh, Interesting. All right, so this is broken out module by module or week by week. So this is just a guideline of what we're going to cover, and it's based on the weekday schedule. I don't have it broken out per each weekend, but I can tell you for today, we're going to get up through, uh, we're going to finish requirements. So we're going to get up well, probably about week five, week six-ish. We're going to cover about five weeks of material in probably one day is what I'm thinking. Uh, which is going to take you close to the midterm. Sometime before the next class meeting, you're going to have information about the midterm that's going to be emailed to you. So when you sign the roster today, make sure to sign the attendance roster that's going around. Uh, we're going to hopefully get you on an email list as well if you're not in the EMS, so we can accumulate these email addresses and these students so we know that who's showing up. Uh, so we can send you out information and say, hey, the midterm's available now. Hey, the finals are coming up. Here's your assigned day that you need to show up on to take the final. And for you guys, it's pretty easy. It's going to be the last weekend of this course, uh, Saturday or Sunday, uh, for the last class meeting. I don't know exactly which date that is, but it's on my website, uh, which is when your final exam is going to be given. So. It's kind of an over and then the uh, midterm will be a take-home exam, so you don't have to worry about showing for that, but you're certainly going to want to know when it's available, I would think, so you could take it and upload it. So. We don't have to worry about presentations. We're not doing them in this class. If you walked in late, there's no class presentations. Uh, but the course student learning outcome and the final exam will be in the last week, very last week. You'll have to turn that in. So. Any questions about the scheduling? timings that are going on. There's no due dates, as I mentioned before, on anything. Everything will be due by the end of the term, the end of the, by the final exam day, hopefully. If you can get it all done, that would be a good target date. No questions. You guys are a quiet group. Are you awake? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? <laughs> good. All right. So let me show you something else. Uh, there's nothing at the end. This is the end of the syllabus. So the schedule's at the end, but the schedule's really not going to mean anything to you because we're not working on the traditional week-by-week -week schedule. Um, but we are sort of following the topics. There's another important uh, file that's out here. It's right underneath the course syllabus. You'll see it's called Class Notes. And I have downloaded the Class Notes. And the downloaded file is sc slash notes. And uh, let's take a look here. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see it. It's uh, approximately 100 something, maybe it's, oh no, it's, uh, it's only 16 pages of downloaded. It's pretty significant in volume, so uh, it's not what I'd call light reading. Oh, I'm starting to download now or open up. You can see it counting on the bottom here. 
It's a uh, hundred and something pages long. What it, this does actually is go through a week by week analysis and it complements the course. It covers all of the topics that I'm going to be covering in the lectures. But it kind of provides a, and the grading, project grading, don't look at this, it's different than the, the new syllabus. Use the syllabus for all of the different point values for everything. Use this as additional reading. And uh, what this is going to do is go through section one, section two, which is going to be essentially week one, week two, week three of the course as we go through. And it's going to cover some background reading on all of the different topics that I'll be talking about. So that's why I say don't bother getting the textbook. Uh, instead, this is a better textbook to read. And I don't actually assign reading out of it, but it's a great way of getting information, let's say, for example, on risk management, on the design specification, on the requirements document. And as an example, I'm going to go to page 25, which is the first template that you're going to be using. So in here, you'll see all of the different templates for all of the different deliverables that you'll be giving me throughout the course as well. And uh, on page 25, Oops, what else have we got here? Page 18. That's probably a more efficient way of doing this, but let's see. I'm almost there. Here we go. On page 25, we've got our software requirements document, which is a template. It's an example. So the uh, course notes will talk about the templates. We'll give you a lot of information about what it is you're putting together. And unless you're familiar with software development, you have no idea what this is yet, because I haven't talked about it, and I'll cover all this stuff in lecture one. Uh, but what we're looking at is just an example. And you'll see one in here for the analysis, you'll see one in here for the design deliverable. So you've got essentially all of the bits and pieces to assemble, and what you'll be doing is putting together a requirements document for your project topic, which is why you have to, to kind of pick a topic. <laughs> I guess you'll have to be able to spec out the requirements for the new advanced EMS system or the whatever it is that you're putting together, the ATM system or something. And uh, as we go through the course, I'll be mentioning page numbers like screen now. Page 25 is the software requirements. I think 40-something or 46 is the analysis document, so the design document, I can't remember. But you see the table of contents, you'll, you'll be able to actually just go ahead and search on keywords and stuff and you'll find the information. And then I'll be referring to certain pieces and components of this document uh, as we go through. And it's not something you really want to, it's 113 pages. It's not something you really want to go download and read tonight or anything like that. I would totally just use it as a reference document, reference point. So, Any questions on the uh, course itself, on the syllabus, about the syllabus, about, about this uh, supplementary reading, this document or anything? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, so, uh, where can we access this document? You can get that document from www.bhecker.com. Uh, yep, right up here. bhecker.com. Uh, where you click on my two, it all has his I2 classes on it, actually. Uh, there's my picture. That's a nice picture. <laughs> you click on summer 2011, and uh, you'll see software engineering weekday and weekend. Uh, for those of you who came in late who are brand new, it's not, probably not a bad idea to repeat it because that's kind of the essential thing you want to, one of the things you want to take away with at least. The email address if you missed that is bhecker at itu.edu. Bhecker is spelled right up here actually. Okay. Hey, remember bhecker.com or write anything down. Then this is your navigation point. Uh, and if you did come in late, also know that I'm video recording all of the lectures. So if you want to see what you missed before you walked in today, <laughs> you can look at it. It's not going to be available probably till the end of today when I upload it. But uh, in any case, you can go back and re you know, listen to it, essentially. That was a very good question. And you have another one. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, on page 25, the same document that we were mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. That is an example. It's just a guideline, right? Yeah, it's just a guideline. Um, in fact, when you look at it, uh, you'll see that uh, 
it's for a very, 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 very old program that the statements are put together for an upgrade to a, like, this was before Windows, and you know, maybe not, I don't know, I mean, it's not even a, it's like a DOS-based program, like a command line interface. Yeah. Uh, no, no, you don't have to know anything about programming languages. You don't know have you don't have to know anything about technology either. In fact, whoever writes these documents up is generally business people. They're not software. Well, they're called software engineers, but they're not programmers. So you're not picking out a programming language like that. Um, that example is very, very, very old. So. Yeah. Oh no 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 no. Yeah, because you're writing that document. You'll be right. You'll be creating whatever it is you want for that. You might say um, any object or any language of your choice. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Thanks for joining. <laughs> I know you repeat. So you just. Actually, you just saved yourself a lot of administrative stuff because oh. you would have been bored listening to all I have to go through all the new stuff for all the new people. I mean, all the old stuff for all the new people. So. Oh, that was another very good question. I like the questions because it helps me understand what it is you guys are confused about. And it cuts down on a lot of emails, too. So. Any other good questions or bad questions? Or any questions? I don't want to be judging your questions now. No? Make sure you do sign the roster that's going around. Because you can, we're going to be here all day, so you can sign it after lunch if you want, or before lunch, something like that nature. So. Um, here's another way that I work. I go as long as I can before I have to take a break, personally. However, you might have to take a break before me. <laughs> so, if that is the case, you may leave, come back, or come in leisurely, <laughs> or, um, I don't know, um, work on your own schedule uh, for the most part. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to keep plugging through. I'm probably going to need a break after this first lecture, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, because this kind of, the first lecture sort of goes along with the syllabus, which is why I like to cover it, like, right after the syllabus, right after what I'm told you everything about all your deliverables and stuff. Now I'm going to put the pieces together, hopefully, for you and tell you what this course is about. It's about the software process, software engineering. Um, and uh, what we're looking at in terms of the process are some fundamental assumptions. So I'm going to go through probably about, ooh, until I get done with this lecture, maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, half hour, 45. Then we'll have our first official break. And we can, so if you, if you have any remaining questions, hold on to them. You'll have to remember them for 45 minutes about the syllabus and stuff. And then you can ask me at the break. And we'll take like a 10-minute break or so. And then we'll have a lunch break as well. And then we'll come back, hopefully. And we'll have <laughs> more stuff. Probably get out about 3-ish, is what I'm thinking. It depends on how many people come back from lunch, I think, as well. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you more details as we go through. And it depends on how fast I go through the lectures. So I've had some coffee today, so I'm probably going to go the speed of light. So we'll see. All right, the software process is based upon an assumption, and the assumption is that good processes will hopefully lead to good software, good product, hopefully. And uh, what we're looking at in terms of following what's called a software development life cycle, which I'm going to talk about coming up. Are you guys familiar with the concept already? Yeah? Well, some of you are. Uh, well, some of you took the software engineering, too, made some assumptions about the process, but you never really worked with it. Now's your opportunity to actually work with it and understand what it is that you've been applying to other concepts. Uh, but it's all about risk assessment, if you think about it. Why do we do anything? It's like, why do we plan a trip ahead of time? Like, you know, everyone can, everyone's been on vacation, I hope, at one point in their life. If you haven't, I don't know. Think of your school at ITU as a vacation. No, that's really bad. Okay, <laughs> no, don't think of it as a vacation. Um, before you left, you packed a bag, clothes, something. I don't know. And with the essentials: toothbrush, toothpaste, comb, or something. You planned an airline flight. It arrived at a certain time. You got a taxi cab, or you got a you got a you got a, a rental car. You got a place to stay. 
hopefully you mapped out. In fact, people get really ex excessive with this. You know, some people when they go on vacation, it's like down to the hour. It's like first we're going to go to this museum, then we're going to have that lunch at that restaurant, and then we're going to go to that museum. Especially when you travel internationally, and people like have these guidebooks and they get everything marked. Right? That's planning, and that's risk assessment. Because the more you plan ahead of time, the lower the risk that you're going to forget your toothbrush, or you're going to forget your shoes, or you're going to get to this foreign country and you're not going to know where you're supposed to be going. You know, you're not going to know anything, and you're not going to see anything. You're not going to have fun because you're trying to plan for fun, for excitement. And actually, some of the planning actually takes away some of the fun <laughs> because it's not, it's predictable almost, you know. Same thing, that entire process is what you're doing in this class. So you're planning to go on a trip. But instead of actually going on a trip, what you're planning is how to develop a software package that's going to take one or two years. But all the planning and all of the analysis happens before the software is actually built. It's kind of like all of the guidebook earmarking of the pages and all of the reservations happen before you actually take this trip. So you're picking out a topic. And we're going to go through a series of development processes. And we're going to come up with a requirement specification. We're going to do some analysis. We're going to have a design document. Then we're going to build a prototype. And then we're going to take off on our trip. <laughs> but you don't actually have to go. Because <laughs> what would happen in the real world is we'd outsource it, you know, which is the reality of the world. Uh, we'd send it off. And in, in the United States, we outsource everything, probably, to India. <laughs> so, Asian company, uh, country, and we uh, send it out, it gets built, it comes back, and it's what exactly what we asked for, hopefully, and the trip goes just as planned, no hang-ups. But lo and behold, we left our comb at home, or we left our toothpaste at home, we forgot it. So we forgot this, we forgot that. So we're going to forget things, we're not going to have a, an exact plan, things don't always go according to plan, ever. Uh, but if it does, what we've done is risk management because now we've predicted what the outcome is going to be. We have a lower likelihood of that software failing. We're going to have a higher likelihood of getting what it is we want, which kind of goes back to that basic assumption that good processes lead to good software. Because hopefully, if we're following a good development methodology, we've done all the planning, we've done everything we need in order to get started. Now, all we have to do is send it off, and there's no surprises, hopefully. Uh, but everybody shows up and the cab's not there. The rental car company's out of business or the hotel's overbooked or something does happen, actually. And it happens in software engineering as well, which is why everything's always over budget and over time. Nothing ever gets delivered on time. That's just a reality. And every one of your vacations never goes exactly as planned either. Something happens. The museum closed early because it's a holiday or something. Or something will happen to you. Uh, but risk management is basically looking at how to reduce the risk, how to plan, how to account for the unknown, and there's a lot of unknowns in software engineering. So this is the process, and it's a simplified version of the process, and this is what we're following for this course, and this is what I just went over in the syllabus, actually. These are your deliverables. Uh, but in the real world, uh, what we're really focusing on is what is in the center box here. Requirements, design, and implementation. So let me take you down a software engineering path for those of you who are healthcare science people or nursing people or I don't know. You've never worked in software engineering before. You've never been exposed to development process. This is the path, actually. It starts over here at the left-hand side. It goes left to right. What we're looking at is a feasibility and a planning. This is what we're going to hopefully do today. You're going to see, is it going to be feasible for people in this room to work together? And for those people who walked in late, yes, there's a group project in this course. It goes for 55% of your grade. So you got to find people to work with, or you got to work solo. If you work solo, you don't have to worry about the people. But that's a lot of work for one person. It's a lot more work than if you work in a group. So there's pros and cons. If you think about it, you don't have to work in a group. But let's say you're going to, you have to plan, and it's like, oh, this is going to be feasible. Someone lives in New York, but hey, they have email. Someone still lives in California. All right. And then you've got to pick a topic out. If you can cover that today, you've accomplished a lot. Um, because then you can figure out, well, let's start the pre planning. We're going to build this new upgrade to the EMS system. You know, this is the sample topic I came up with earlier. And uh, here's the team members. 
And then in the real world, you do what's called a feasibility study. And we talked about that in software engineering, too, actually. A feasibility study is kind of the starting point of the go or the no-go. And it's the paperwork that goes into this phase that says, yes, give me your money. Let's go get some funding. Let's get, you know, give me all your money so we can build this thing. Knowing that you're taking every last dollar your grandmother has or something. and <laughs> You don't want to blow it. You want to make sure this works. If you've done a feasibility plan, you have that assurance that it will. Once the project gets started, then you're in this middle box, which is why we have three boxes going on. And these are the project deliverables. And there's really only three areas or three main activities. We've got the requirement specification document that exists in the real world. We have a design document that exists in the real world. And hopefully, lo and behold, we'll have some implementation that exists in the real world. Whether or not the team does the implementation or whether or not it's outsourced is a decision for the process, but it's still part of the process. That's actually a problem a lot of American companies uh, fail, to, uh, fail to recognize. They think of it as outsourced. They don't really have to do anything. They just call up XYZ, Acme Inc., a software development company, and they, hey, can you give us an accounting program? And the company's like, oh, I guess. <laughs> All right, sell you an accounting program. Uh, and they don't do any of the uh, analysis. They don't do any of the feasibility studies. They don't do any of the analysis. They don't do any of the design. They don't do anything except for expect everybody else to do And then they're just implementing it. So it's a stage of the implementation that's missing everything else prior to that, which is why a lot of the outsourcing actually fails. Where people go, oh, you know, I'm not paying for this. This, what, did, what is this thing? And there's so much problems with it. It's just ridiculous. But if it's done correctly, it actually does work. Um, so we go through requirements, we go through the design, we go through the implementation stages, which is what we're focusing on in this particular course. And then eventually we have the operation and the maintenance that happens. Because it's kind of like, mm, software is not like hardware. Hardware is more reliable. Hardware actually works, hopefully, unless it wears out. Software has bugs. It's not necessarily as solid as the hardware solution. It also wears out. It also becomes obsolete as well. So we have operation and maintenance. We actually have to keep it running, keep it working, upgrade it to new operating systems, change the features around. That's an entirely different stage of the development process, uh, referred to as maintenance. So the software development life cycle model goes through all of this stuff, and it breaks it out into stages. It's kind of like a cookie cutter template that's used to develop the software. What we're going to follow in this course is called the waterfall model. And uh, here it is, waterfall model. And it goes through a series of development stages or phases where one leads to the next, leads to the next. And uh, what we're looking at is, and I always use this expression and people wonder why. And I often wonder, why do they present it this way? And the project is going downhill from the beginning. <laughs> it's like things that go downhill are a negative. For some reason, maybe it's just maybe it's just an American thing. And ask, oh yeah, down the drain, down the toilet, downhill. But that's what the water that's what the water bottle, waterfall, you know, if you think about a waterfall, the water goes downhill. Well, waterfalls look pretty nice, you know. So when you go on your vacations, you take pictures of waterfalls usually. <laughs> so it's supposed to be a positive thing, a beautiful model flowing nicely downhill, but it, what ends up happening is, yeah, the project goes downhill right from the beginning, and that's one of the faults of the model, actually, and here's why. We look at requirements as, you know, requirements definition, requirements, and we have deliverables that come out of this. So your first assignment as your team, outside of picking your team and your topic, is to come up with this template that I just showed you, what we just talked about on page 25 in the course notes, the requirement specification document. So you're dreaming up, and I'm going to talk about requirements today so you'll know what that means. You're dreaming up all these features and all these requirements for the software, and then you stop. Here it is. There's the requirement specification document. Sign on a dotted line, pay us $100,000, and we'll build it for you. Okay. And then you go into the software and the system design. You take the software requirement specification as is, no modifications, and you build your software design off of that. It's kind of like when you plan a trip. <laughs> oh, beautiful plan. And then you realize, oh, museums closed on Sundays. Ah, bummer. We're only there on Sunday. 
uh-oh, we can't do it. This is not going to work. If you don't go back, if you follow the waterfall model, you're not going back to change the time or the day that you're supposed to be at this location. Instead, you have to make it work. That's one of the faults of the waterfall model is there's no feedback and there's no, there's no going back and visiting requirements anymore. You're stuck. And one of the dilemmas is, okay, we go back and we fix the requirements. And then you don't get an approval from the customer or, you know, I don't know, something happens. Or you, you don't find everything. Because as you're going through the system and the software design and the programming and everything, you're learning more about the system. You're understanding what it is the customer actually wanted. And you're stuck. Because now you go back and change the schedule. You go back and change the program. One of the downfalls in the uh, waterfall model that's why everything goes downhill. <laughs> it gets worse and worse as you go down. If you can actually make it to operation and maintenance, you're successful. Because otherwise, that project could fail somewhere along the ways. Uh, oops. So in terms of the requirements, after we have our requirement specification document and a beautiful thing following the template, course notes, then we actually take that and we do some analysis on it. And then you have this artificial document that you're going to give me called the analysis document that doesn't exist in the real world. This is the behind the scenes work that goes on for about six months to a year that the development team has nothing to show for. <laughs> this is when you're being paid and you haven't delivered anything at all because you've been doing analysis. And eventually you pop out this thing called a design document. The design document will also be one of your deliverables. Uh, so you have it broken out into three instead of two. So you have, an, you have a requirement specification, you have an analysis document, and a design document. In the real world, you only have two requirements and design. But there's a big gap between those two. So for the purposes of this course, I invented this thing called the analysis document. And uh, it's purely fictional. It's something that you know, you're going to give me. And it really, what it is, it's a rough draft to your design document. Because it's going to have all your pre-analysis, and I'll talk about that in probably the second class meeting. Now, we're going to cover analysis today, but we'll cover the design in the next class session. Uh, most of the work of the project is in the requirements specification, and hopefully you'll have that ready and done before the next class meeting. Uh, but I'll talk about that as we, as, as we wrap up this weekend. I'll talk about what it is you need to do between now and next time. So, uh, so we go from system and software design to programming and unit testing to integration testing to operation and maintenance and we break it all out all the different uh, different phases and different steps as we go through and it makes a clear easy kind of pattern like a cookie cutter pattern to follow which is kind of easy in terms of understanding the model which is why the waterfall model is the most widely used in fact the department of defense still uses this government contracts use this Traditional software development life cycles use this. Uh, in the higher tech companies, smaller companies, they'll use a combo. This has some problems. So we talked about, as I mentioned already, you know, we might discover something here that we didn't know about in earlier stages that, you know, hang on back and fix it. So we have some variations to the waterfall model. The most popular one would be the spiral model, where we go in a circle. Actually, and I think it's in one of these slide sets. And when you see it, you'll understand it probably. Where you're revisiting all of these stages over and over again. You're doing a little requirements, a little bit of analysis, a little bit of design, going back to the requirements, doing a little analysis, and you're kind of going in a circle until you get it all done. And there's also iterative development, where you've got, you know, one piece, one module, and you got the other piece, the other module added to it. If you're thinking about an accounting program, you can iteratively develop module by module, accounts payable, accounts receivable, reporting feature, and kind of go through as a cycle each one of the modules and iteratively. It's kind of very similar to the um, spiral model uh, because you're revisiting over and over again, but you're doing it like feature by feature, module by module. And then we have what's called rapid application development and um, or rapid prototyping. That's what like a company like Google does. Um, they're not going to wait two years. How long it would be? You know, how many other people would beat them in the market if they waited two years to produce something? <laughs> Instead, what they do is they produce a prototype to put it out there on the market, and you start using the prototype. It's called rapid application development or rapid prototyping because 
they're producing the product before they've even analyzed, before they've done requirements analysis design. They've stopped all that stuff and actually are doing life cycle model in reverse. <laughs> they've implemented it, put it out there, and then work backwards and build it and then finish it the opposite direction, essentially starting with a prototype. And the way they developed the Gmail uh, Gmail, Gmail yeah. You've noticed we have even more. I think there's some new features coming out too. Favorites, something associated with favorites or something. Yeah, yeah. I remember the first version of Gmail. <laughs> it didn't do anything, and I'm like, why? Am I, why are this? Why is this so popular? <laughs> and I realized, oh, it's IMAP now. So I don't have to worry about pop settings and downloading my email. I can get it anywhere I want. You know, so that was good. So is it like uh, when uh, they are creating a prototype of the system and uh, then they yeah. are uh, making it? Open? to the end users and I mean is it a kind of they're getting feedback through the prototype. Is it is it a kind of beta testing? Um, they're yeah. through that. Well they're building in a it, it's, it's called rapid application development because what they're doing is putting it out there before they even have it. They putting the full application out before it's even functional. They don't do any testing and all that stuff Nothing. in the organization. They just put it out there and then work backwards. <laughs> Go back through and build features onto it after they've got user input. Netscape browser was the first actually high tech company that did that. The first versions of those browsers that came out were uh, templates. <laughs> yeah, they were like pages with a bunch of colors and stuff on it. And like, what do you do with this thing? Oh, you can load up a URL, but it didn't format anything correctly. It didn't support any plugins. Didn't have an email. And then they started adding features to it after they get user input. So it's kind of like beta testing yeah. without the alpha. It's, you know, starting with something and then getting, oh, this doesn't work. Oh, that doesn't work either. Oh, that's a bad idea. Oh, we don't like this feature. And then, you know, do you like this feature? So a lot of apps actually start out that way. Have you ever noticed how many updates there are to an app? If so you've got an iPhone, if you have a G phone, a, G a Gmail phone or whatever, a Google phone. Like every week, every day, there's like an update to something. It's because they're giving you a prototype and they're working backwards. So can we say that RAD model is good for the product-based companies? I mean, there are two types of companies. One is a consultancy and ah, another is product-based. The reason why it's called rapid application development is because it's fast. Rapid. Yeah. Uh, so what ends up happening is when you need to get it out before everybody else gets it out, that's why it makes, makes Google as a company more uh, innovative. And they've got it out first. It's a piece of junk, <laughs> but they have it out. And it's working, and people see it, and they go, oh, yeah, we came out with this first. But did they really come out with it? You know, they had the idea, they rapidly put it out there. If you're building a system for a university, you're not going to do that. You're going to follow a more traditional model that's going to, you know, let's put it out in two years, and you plan ahead. You say, well, two years from now, we're going to introduce the new release of the EMS or something. You build it behind the scenes, then you put it out when it's fully functional and ready to go. Why do you do that? Because you want to reduce your risk, because you can't afford to have every one of your students lose their transcripts or something. Yeah. It's critical data. Yes? So basically, we use RAD for uh, Agile. Mm -hmm. You can't use it for what? Agile software development is actually kind of a different concept, but it's very similar to RAD. Very, very similar. So, I mean, I Um, the speed to market and also the amount of documentation that's produced. In a traditional waterfall model, you've built the system over the last two years, you've got it well documented, it's well planned for, because you planned ahead of time. And you can reproduce that a lot easier. When you do the rapid application development kind of concept, you have nothing. <laughs> and then you, when you, every time you do it again, you start from scratch. Because you've learned nothing from the development process. And you're always working backwards. And it's almost like flipping a coin. Oh, will that work? No. Nope. Will that work? No. Nope. Will that work? And that's what you, that's how you're developing. So there's no planning. It's like, I'm going to get a degree in this. And you start taking classes and then you figure out, oh, wrong classes. Okay, scratch those classes. Let me take these classes instead. It takes longer to actually finish it. 
So that's the that's the whole oxymoron of this whole rapid problem. <laughs> Gmail's not even finished yet. How long has Gmail been on the market? Gmail may never finish. <laughs> so, uh, is it true that Waterfall is only for mass production applications? No, Waterfall is used... Actually, let me, let me, before I even continue with that reply, nobody actually uses the strict Waterfall model anymore. What they've done is they've modified the Waterfall model to suit the needs of the company. So what ends up happening, and I have another slide, but it's not coming up for a few, where you have lines going this way on the opposite direction and where we have feedback. So you create a feedback loop so that sequential projects get better and better because you learn from experience. And the current project, you can actually go back and modify the requirements and go back, but you're doing it while the development is still going on. So you've got it flowing downhill, but you've got the little feedback coming back through so that you can fix something. Because the sooner you fix the problem, the better, because it takes less time. If you wait until the integration and the testing to find a bug, you're, you're, you're hosed. It's going to take twice as long to fix it later on in the development process than it would have just to fix it right up there in the requirements. So what a lot of companies do is they modify this model and they create a custom feedback loop they, they rearrange the stages a little bit or make things more concurrent mm -hmm. rather than having everything run sequentially, which is the traditional model run sequence, one to the other, just how this is pointed out, they'll stack it up a little bit. They'll put two things at one and or they'll, go, they'll use something like this, Oops, a variation of this. They'll stack up the analysis, the design a little bit so that it can actually fall more in a spiral versus it's a hybrid a spiral versus a, a strict waterfall. The only people that I'm familiar with that actually use the real waterfall are government contracts. <laughs> because if you think about it, the larger the organization, a lot of these government have huge contracts, the more organized, the more structure you need. You can't be sending feedback up through to go change your requirements. It's set in stone. This is the way we're going to build it. This is the way we're going to build it. No one's going to change it. It's a bureaucracy. So after you've gotten a signature and a sign off and approval, you gotta go back and get it again. That's gonna take forever, so you just continue. Not as effective in the long run. It does not build innovative, cutting edge technology programs. It builds solid banking programs. If you're Wells Fargo and you're building a new ATM software package, you're gonna use this model. Why, because this has more planning ahead of time, <laughs> more structure, more suitable for large development groups. Little apps, little rapid application, one guy sitting alone in his garage or and actually sitting in a little cubicle over at the Google place, he can be a one-man software engineering team right there because he doesn't have to communicate with anybody. He has not, he's not planning anything, no processes, no formal model. Instead, he's just producing it Skipping everything, implementing it, and working backwards. Longer. It takes twice, three times as long to build something that way. Not quite as good, either. The end product is hacked. It's kind of like when you first took, uh, assuming that you guys have taken a programming course before, the first couple of programs you built were probably bad. You know, they probably had excessive control loops in them, extra variables you didn't need, five extra lines of code where you could have reduced it down to one or something if you were using, like, C or C++. The uh, format of the code probably wasn't very optimal. You probably left out all your comments or put too many comments in. But the more you wrote it, the better you got at it. So, same thing with rapid application development, which is why Google is so successful. The more they put out, which is why they hire these guys who just, you put everything, they only take like maybe 5, 10% of everything these guys produce, because it's crap. <laughs> they find one or two good things out of there, and then they find the good ones, they pay them big bucks, and they just keep producing these stu this stuff, this, you know, this web development stuff, which is pretty much how they grow fast, so rapidly. Any other questions before I continue? Excellent questions, by the way. Uh, all right, requirements analysis and definition, the first stage of your development process, if you're following this. 
The phase can actually be broken out into feasibility requirements, analysis requirements, definition requirements, specification. So I got three words that say requirements on them with three different definitions. And this is where most of the confusion comes into. Like, I thought you were talking about requirements. I am. There's requirements analysis, requirements design, definition, requirements specification. So you see SRS, SRD. You never see SRA anymore. Nobody ever analyzes. Or nobody ever analyzes anything anymore. They just come up with specifications and definitions. They're both the same thing. They're just different levels of abstraction. So this whole software development process is about different varying degrees of abstraction. A definition and a specification. When you define something, you're saying the program will have an input field for the username and password. And then you create a specification, which is about twice as much verbiage. So you say the definition is easy, and that's what you're creating for your project. You don't have to do a specification, you're doing a definition. That's why we call it a design document instead of a design specific, excuse me, requirements document instead of a requirement specification. Specifications are about that thick. <laughs> Definitions are about half as thick. You say, to, to define something, you say, well, it has a name and a password. The specification says, we'll have a name that will consist of an alphanumeric combination with one special character, or maybe that's the password. That's more like a password. The name would be, it you know, has to be between four and seven characters long. You're specifying that you're having a name and a password, and you're also providing the implementation or the specifics or the specifications about how it needs to actually be implemented. But you're trying to avoid the how at this point, and you're looking at the what. What will it contain? Well, it will contain a name, and it will contain a password. And what we want for the name is we want it to be four to seven characters. And what we want for the password is blah, 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 and all this other stuff. So in the requirement spec, we're saying what we want, what, what, what it is, what we're going to actually implement. We take the what, we turn it into the how through the analysis that we're performing. And then the how gets written up into what's called the design document. So your what is all about requirements. What is we're implementing? Uh, which is what we're looking at in terms of these deliverables. And we can produce these different, we can use these different phases and we can produce these different deliverables. Or we can modify it, which is the interesting thing about software engineering. And it goes back to kind of one of those typical age-old questions. Is software engineering really an engineering discipline? <laughs> That's been argued for years because, you know, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, all these other types of engineering, well, they have processes. Yeah, so does software engineering, yeah, process, yeah, software development, life cycle models, and stuff like that. Uh, but we break the rules. Software engineering doesn't follow strict engineering, like computer engineering or electrical engineering standards. We're more flexible. <laughs> so some people call us an engineering discipline, and some people don't consider it, you know, I don't know, programming. A lot of people think software engineering is actually programming. It really isn't. <laughs> it, is not. it is not. It has nothing to do with programming. Yeah. You ask any, any actually you ask any business person in America, they say, well, what is software engineering? Uh, programming? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it's everything but the programming. Programming is an implementation. It's just one phase of it. So, so computer science people, in fact, I usually get this with undergraduate students because I, I teach in computer science programs and I teach in software engineering programs. Computer science people, they take calculus, algorithms, data structures, programming language concepts, operating system concepts. They take, they take all of these core hardware, software, technology type courses. Software engineering people, they take development <laughs> methodologies. They, take, they learn UML, they learn software engineering, the discipline in terms of software development, life cycles, risk assessment, all of the other things, testing, QA, those would be software engineering type topics. So. A system and software design is the design of the system based upon the requirements and only the requirements. You don't build the design off of meetings that you've had with the design, with the 
with people, which is kind of interesting. If you're really following a methodology or a systematic approach to the software development, you're basing each one of the subsequent phases off of the previous phase. So your requirements document is your contract. You're setting in stone what it is you're going to build. And then the how comes into the system design, and it's based completely off of the requirements. So it's just why the requirements is probably the most important part of the entire um, process. Then we have programming and unit testing. After we've designed it, and then we send it out, or we hire a consultant to come in, usually programmers, just, eh, the people who write the code aren't the people who maintain the code. Uh, usually it's not necessary. it doesn't have to be the same person. In the old days, before we actually had real software engineering going on in this country, we had extreme programmers <laughs> who would come in and like they would do everything. They would do the design, the analysis, the programming, the coding, everything. And then they were indispensable. You couldn't get rid of them because <coughs> they didn't document anything. And yeah, and then they were very, very, very expensive because you can't get rid of them. You can't afford to get rid of this person. Now nah, they're disposable. <laughs> Programmers are trained monkeys. You hand them a bunch of design documents and say, hey, build it. Like, we can get anyone to build it. And what ends up happening in really large companies where it's mission critical is you get multiple teams working on the design and then multiple teams working on the implementation and you take the best of three or the best of two. So it's not like a unique skill anymore. It's more of a, you know, this is how you do it. This is what you want me to do. It's like building a house. In fact, software engineering is like, well, the planning process is like taking a trip. You build everything as a house. What do you do with a house? You pick out some land, <laughs> right? Get an architect in there. Well, that's your requirement specification right there. Mm -hmm. Architectural design. Well, actually, that's the requirements and the design all in one. You take the architectural designs, the permits and everything to a construction company who comes in and builds the house. Different construction companies are going to use different methods of building it. Some might be better than others. You know, if you had the same house built by three different companies, you'd probably get three different results, maybe. One of them would be more to spec than another one would be. And one of them's out finished faster. But essentially, that's what you're doing when you outsource. You're sending it out to our construction company to put it together, and you're getting back what you asked for, what was in that architectural design. Yeah? But you end up spending more money It's risk assessment and risk management and planning. Imagine you have invested millions of dollars into this new EMS system. It must be out for fall 2011. You have one team working on it, and you have one implementation of it. You're putting a lot of risk into that team. If you have two teams working on it, one of them might finish before the other one. One may not ever finish. But you have more options, you're leveraging your bet that you're going to actually have it delivered on time. And you've got, you know, one team that's going to come out with a fabulous design and the other team is going to come out with a sucky design. Or you have the implementations that are, you know, going to have issues. Because here's the problem. Can you really assess the skill level of a programmer or a developer? Anyone who's ever done any hiring? You don't always know what you're going to get. <laughs> the guy comes in, he wears a nice suit. Sounds intelligent, knows all the acronyms, knows all the buzzwords, but does he really know anything? You don't find out until three months into the project when you, and a guy hasn't delivered anything, or what he's delivered is complete crap. You can't use it. And you're going, oh, man, why did we hire this guy? Who hired this guy? <laughs> and you have to find a new guy. But if you hire two guys, and both of them are working tag team or simultaneously on the same work, and one of them's doing really nice work, and the other guy is doing sucky work. They cancel him in the beginning. So rarely will both teams actually produce something. Usually one team will stop midstream because you cut your losses. You know which team's going to actually produce it. You know which team's going to actually come out with what it is you're looking for. You get rid of the other team immediately. You lay them all off. And you keep the good ones. You put them on the other project. Hey, look, we've we got another project going on here. Go over here. You get rid of those extra people and you cut your losses and you, you made out ahead because you leveraged your bet. It's kind of like when you go to Reno and you, I don't know you guys are familiar with gambling, craps or something, you know, you bet against each other. You know, I think it's going to, I think it'll crap out. Nope, it's not going to crap out. You could 
actually leverage it so you could walk away, break even. <laughs> but you're still having fun. Went maybe, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, whole, just, the, the hope is that you're having fun. So um, that's actually kind of a new concept, not having fun, but multiple development is actually kind of a new concept that's been going on. Uh, because programmers are a dime a dozen. In the old days, it was hard to put together a team. Now they're everywhere. Now they're unemployed. Now you just pay them a little bit less or whatever. And you, you get them together. You get multiple people together. You figure out what's happening, what's working, and then you get rid of everything that's just not working. So it's, it's kind of a great way of finding people who are disposable. And a lot of consultants do this. In fact, you probably are working on something where there's another team doing the same thing you're doing. Or maybe you're on the good team that has survived that's going to finish the project, hopefully. Or maybe you're working at a company that keeps moving you to different projects for some reason. Because they like you, but the project that you're working on is going to be canceled. <laughs> so you get hopping around in new projects. Which is why it's so easy to find and use consultants for this. Because it's not permanent work. You're gonna hire. You're gonna hire a full-time programmer. No. What do you need a full-time pro programmer for? Yeah, but that's what you get. The, that's what you get the consultants for. That's what you get. The, the guys come in. You work on no company unless you're a software engineering house, and that's what you're doing, which is a different scenario completely. They hire full-time developers. If you're XYZ company and you're building a new EMS system. You're not going to staff a full-time programmer for five years or so, four years. You're going to bring them in. Because think of the concept. We're going through this waterfall model or some development process. What's the program we're going to be doing while you're coming up with your requirements? Different set of people come up with the requirements. A different set of people do the analysis. A different set of people do the design work. You bring in the experts. So another reason why this is actually kind of a good point I actually accidentally led into. <laughs> If you follow the process development model, you can hire, you can cut your resources, save money, hire when needed, bring your experts in, get a, a data, database architect in there, get a business guy who knows how to communicate well, who can elicit good requirements out of the customers, get a software developer who can actually build the right system models, get an implementer who can build it correctly. He may not know anything about database architectures, but he knows about programming. You know? So you, you actively go out, seek out the right professional people, put them together, assemble them, bring them in when they're needed, get rid of them when you don't need them anymore. You don't hire any of these people full time. I mean, unless you're doing this for a living. Unless you're a company who's actually doing this forever. Otherwise, you hire people temporary and bring them in. But it's excellent because that's what you guys are doing in your CPT training. <laughs> And we can find extremely talented people <laughs> who come in, who are here, who provide a resource that we need, actually. Because you guys are more technical. You guys have the training. Well, some of you actually come in with degrees already in software engineering, degrees in computer science. You have lots of experience, more so than the locals do. We hire you. You, only, you don't work there full time for your entire career. You only work there for six months, four months, three months, and then you move on another training opportunity. Like, I don't know why they call it training. <laughs> Critical practice, what is it? CPT? Practical training. Is it really, are you, are you training? Curriculum training? I guess it is, it's work experience. It's work training, I guess. Well, some of the companies actually teach you. They find a person with the right skill set, they give you training. <laughs> send you and get you Oracle certified or something, and then you actually perform for them. Which, you know, you're somebody who wants to do it, but you're not going to be there. You're not, you're not going to be there for 20 years. As the local American who has a family, and a, you know, I don't know, has a, this expectation of working for one company from the time they graduate from college to their retirement. It's like a thing of the past. It's like the Japanese philosophy. I think it's still going on in Japan, but I'm not, not hip on that. I'm not up to speed with that. But in the old days, about 10 years, 20 years ago, you worked your entire life at one company. And, like, the company was your life. Like, even your half hours and your friends all were at the company. And that you ate and slept, like, in the same quarters as everybody. I <laughs> mean, you lived there. 
but or at least she went home occasionally to see her family. But it's different. Like this different philosophy. So that's why some companies like to hire foreigners who are coming. Kind of, they think that it's a different philosophy. It's, you're here for a different purpose. You're doing. You're providing a service that they they can't get. But it's a different kind of concept. Operation and maintenance. So we've been going through integration and testing, operation and maintenance. Eh, you can get a career as a maintenance engineer if you wanted to. QA. Actually, are you guys taking the? I think you, guys, you guys were talking about that QA program, or maybe it was somebody else. Um, the three classes now for the QA certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's what you're doing in operation and maintenance. QA. Uh, maybe it's not fair. It's not not the same. QA should happen actually throughout the development process. It shouldn't be a last minute. But unfortunately, that's another problem with the waterfall model. It brings up a really good point as well. With the waterfall model, this happens at the very end. Well, operation and maintenance is going to happen at the very end. However, you could build the concepts in throughout the development process. It's like how testing always ends up being last in the waterfall model. It's like, why do you wait until the very last minute to test something when you're already over budget, already over time, you have to deliver it yesterday, and then I haven't even <laughs> tested it yet. So other variations to the waterfall model make testing right up there with requirements. You know, put it right at the beginning and make sure that the activities flow throughout the entire life cycle and not just happen at the end. Operation and maintenance it has to happen towards the end. But we have maintenance engineers that take over that aren't the original programmers that will essentially, I just noticed some interesting characters on the slide set. Those are supposed to be bullet points. I'm not quite sure what, what font that was actually supposed to be in. Long story short, uh, we have the developers, you guys, perhaps, who are doing a CPT at a company who are implementing something, taking a design spec and building it. Then you go away. Then you move on to your next CPT. And then we bring in a, another person who's a maintenance person who has never seen the software before, has never worked with it, but is there now to fix problems and bugs. They keep it operational. They hack away at it so much. And not to say that there's any skill level difference. It's just imagine you have to come in later, pick up somebody else's program, somebody else wrote that you were never involved with to begin with. Come up to speed, learn it, and then start maintaining it and fixing it. Anything that you do anyway to that entire application is going to ruin it, <laughs> which is called software decay. That's a natural part. Software actually gets old decays, turns into garbage. Because if you think about the concept, the software should be written from the design specification. So somebody took the requirements, did some analysis, created this design document. The software should be implemented per the design document. Anything you do that's different from that design is, it's like going back to the house example. Perfect, one, one story flat house and someone decides, let's make it a two-story. You start building on top of it, you take the roof off, you change the entire structural composition of that house, and then you realize, well, maybe we should have made the foundation one inch thicker. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Who's going to pick up the house and add another inch of cement to that foundation to support the beams or whatever needed to be supported? No one's going to do that. That's how the software decays. You think about you know maybe we should have used used a bigger database, a different data structure, or a different algorithm, or all the foundational stuff starts crest starts flying away on you or degrading essentially in quality, uh, which just happens. So we have phase out strategies where you take after it's been maintained for a certain amount of time, and then you phase it out and you start it with another brand new development process. So software engineering projects are brand new developments. They are upgrades. They are um, slight feature modifications. Um, they could consist of a lot of different things, hardware and software components as well. Uh, but we normally we think of software engineering as a software engineering, as a software product. But it can contain both. So for your purposes of your uh, projects that you're doing in this course, you can do an upgrade if you want. You can pick a system that you like and add some features to it. But if you're going to do an upgrade, you're going to treat it like a brand new development process. So you're going to have to go through requirements, analysis, and design, which means you actually have to go back and re-engineer, which might be actually harder than starting from scratch. 
and saying, I just want to build a brand new registration system. But you have a choice. You can do it either way. So let me finish up this discussion of the waterfall model. What we've got here are some advantages and some disadvantages. I've actually gone through this stuff already. So I can just kind of use this as a summary. Uh, the advantages, the process visibility. You know, breaking it out into those stages is a clear and easy kind of thing to see. Uh, we have uh, dependence on individuals rather than the entire team. Uh, so we have individuals we can bring in, as I mentioned before, contractors and things. Uh, quality control can go on. We can actually have standards, templates, and things that are for each one of the, de the deliverables. We can actually make sure we have deliverables, sign-offs, checks, milestones, and things of that nature, and cost control. If we've got it all broken out, <sighs> We can say, you have a budget, and you have a budget, and you have a budget. The problem a lot of companies do is they wait too long to break it all out, and they've gone through half of their budget before they realize what they actually need the resources for. So they like spend the first couple of months spending money, and then they realize they don't have enough money left. Uh-oh, we need more investors. After they've broken out all the phases, and they looked at it and went, oh, it's going to cost a lot more than we expected. Why don't we spend all that money for sending everybody to Hawaii for a group bonding experience in the beginning when none of these people are ever even going to work on this team project at all. So we wasted a bunch of money. Disadvantages each stage is a process reveals new understandings of the previous stages I mentioned before. That requires earlier stages to be revised. So you can't assume. In fact, that's one of the biggest problems. You can't assume done everything correctly. So you have to have feedback. And here's our feedback loop. This is that line I was trying to draw earlier, but it wasn't on the screen. I knew it was coming up. Where we go from down and we come back up. So we go downhill, but we also have to come back uphill. <laughs> so we can't always just go down and down the toilet. We actually have to get out of the toilet and come back up. <laughs> Iterative refinement. This is a summary of what I've actually I've already told you already in terms of going back uh, so the concept is that the initial implementation for the user's comments comes out. Then we have refinement until the uh, system is actually complete. So in a lot of ways, the rapid application is an iterative process. So Google sends out a Gmail program and says, well, wouldn't it be nice? I mean, one feature of Google, by the way, that I cannot stand. I cannot stand this. And it happens on their Google map. Excuse me, their Google mail programs on their mobile devices, on their Android systems. You know when you delete a message, it deletes the whole thread. <laughs> I wish they would fix that. But what's ended up happening is all those features came about through feedback. Somebody in the world, one of you guys sitting here, wanted that feature. <laughs> You're making my life rough. Because I wish that feature wasn't there. I, I lose the whole thread. <laughs> I'm sure this has happened to some of you guys in this class. But somebody wanted that. It was all user driven. Somebody wanted it threaded. I don't even like the thread concept. So as a user, you know, I've actually, I've actually told, I've sent email feedback into them saying, hey, can you get rid of this thread? And actually there are, and then I got a reply one time, so there's applications that you can download that doesn't do it. Like the Mozilla mail, you can delete it, you can delete message by message, you don't have to, it doesn't delete the whole thread. And it's just the Google default programs do it that way. And long story short, it's iterative refinement, believe it or not, because as user comments come in, they refine the interface so that it can work with a different mail client, so they refine the features. Somebody wanted threading, somebody wanted color coding. There's this new feature out, I think, right now, that priorities or something. You can get priorities on the downloads or something. I don't know what the whole feature is about. I don't use it. Friends, different categories, labels. Who in the world call them labels? That's a Gmail specific, the label concept. It took me a long time to figure that one out. Like, ah, folders. <laughs> Those are labels. But it's a process of going through and uh, looking at vaporware, mockups, throwaway software components, dummy modules, rapid prototyping, successive refinement, which is kind of the modern day rapid application environment that we're looking at, which is all iterative. But, and here's our picture where we have the requirements, the design, the analysis, and the prototyping, and the implementation. And we got, look at this little spiral. That's why it's sometimes referred to as the spiral model. Iterative re development, spiral, is all the same thing. It's just the same thing as rapid application development and agile. 
it kind of overlaps a little bit as well, but it, adds, it kind of adds on a few more concepts to, to rapid application development. That, that's an entire lecture in itself. And here's our iterative requirement. If we take it and throw a waterfall on top of it, it's really the same stuff, uh, which is what we're going to get with all of these software development models. They all have the same phases. How are you going to do the phases? Where are you going to do it? Is the difference. Yeah, so. But they're pretty much all covering the same um, activities. So. And here's the concurrent activities going on in terms of the iterative process. What does this one say? Oh, it's the same thing, concurrent activities, concurrent activities. Um, this is more of what we see when we see the initial release, we see the intermediate versions, and then we see the final version. Otherwise, what we end up with is just the final version. In the old days, they used to call this alpha beta. Because they put names on it, and they say, ah, so, or they called it prototyping. This is prototype. And then some of those prototypes turned into the product, some of the prototypes were throwaway. So. We have different terminology that's been used throughout the years, uh, but basically what we're looking at is getting out version 1, version 2, version 3. In fact, if you think about it, isn't all software that way? Have we, ever, I mean, we don't have version 1 of anything anymore, but now we have like version 3. I think even Windows started out with version 3.0. <laughs> version 3, version 4, version 5, isn't it really just iterative refinement? Oh, we fixed this. Oh, we fixed that. Oh, we fixed this too. Oh, we added this feature. Great. I mean, even the Android systems were like that. Now, now I'm going to, oh, let's put a different name on it now. Observations about the software process. So some concluding remarks in terms of the software development lifecycle models. Complete projects should look like the waterfall, but the development process is always partly evolutionary. It has to be. Unless we're the government. And then we can spend a lot of money do a lot of things and then cancel projects without ever finishing them because we have the power and we're a bureaucracy so we can't afford to be iterative or evolutionary. So. so the risk is lowered by prototyping key components which is what you're doing in your project. So you have a requirements, you have this made up illusionary analysis document, you have the design document, you have a prototype and then you're done. At that point we're never going to implement it. But you could theoretically take your project and implement it. So here's what the problem is for some of you who are going to be forming groups and you're thinking about project topics. Uh, you're going to pick projects that you're working on already that are half done. Or you're going to pick projects that already exist. You say, well, it's harder to work backwards because what you've got is already a finished product. It's hard to go backwards and pick, come up with a requirement spec, come up with an, an analyze the requirements. It's, it, it will cause too much confusion for you. Believe it or not, the easiest thing to do is pick something brand new, no one's working on. You don't have to implement it. But that will make your life easier, believe it or not. All the tricks that students play to make the project easy fail. <laughs> they all work against you. <laughs> Just FYI. Don't try to cheat the process. <laughs> it takes longer to cheat the process than it does to actually just do it. Prototyping, dividing into phases, following a visible software process as well, making use of reusable components. These are some of the things I talked about actually in software engineering too. Uh, those of you who are taking this backwards. Um, so you'll get the foundational stuff now. Uh, so what we're looking at in terms of the feasibility study in the beginning, before the project actually starts, right at the beginning you can do the we're going to make it, we're not going to make it type of decision where you've identified the client, the scope, the potential benefits, what are the risks, how they can be minimized, some of those issues in terms of feasibility, and then coming up with a decision. Uh, in your particular case, you're going to make it, so you don't get to decide. That makes your project too easy. 55% of your grade up, oh, we've decided this is not feasible. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> yep, you got to find something that is hopefully feasible. If not, you're never going to know anyway. You're never going to actually implement it. And uh, in the production, uh, what you're looking at is a budget request and a proposal that comes out of it. So in this conclusion, the kind of slides that are going on right now, it's coming up with deliverables. So if we follow a software process, formal process, we can use the requirement spec and the feasibility and everything we've done in the pre-planning as part of the contractual obligation, as part of the legal documents, as well as the uh, format and the schedule the budgeting, everything's based upon those requirements that you 
solicited at the beginning. They come out of the uh, feasibility study, which you don't really have to do. So you're for your class project, so what are you going to treat and why? A client is going to be, well, going to be me and the rest of the class. It's going to be the class, I have two clients, fellow students, professor. Can you satisfy both of them? Yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> if you have questions, you can send me an email message and say, hey, can we build this? And they can say, yeah. Or, no, don't build that. <laughs> uh, what are the boundaries of the team projects? Must be completed in only oh, 15 weeks. Need a prototype. That's going to feature some of the main features. I'll talk about prototyping in the second in a session that we have, second weekend, not this weekend. Potential benefits, you don't really need that, but if you actually kind of think about it, this is the hardest part of the project is coming to come up with a topic. If you think about it, you could base it upon perhaps the potential benefit, which might be as an example, create a marketable product. And this is basically what ends up happening in most of these entrepreneurs that go out and say, I want to build a software program, which is what you're doing. It's like, okay, I have to build a project for this class. What am I going to do? I'm going to build a software project. You think, oh, we could build an upgrade to something. We could build a brand new thing. We could provide a benefit. If you think about the benefits, you might actually have an easier time coming up with something because everyone wants to know why. Why are you doing this? I want to build an upgrade to the EMS system or a brand new EMS system or a marketable product. Maybe make something more efficient for an organization, automate something that a company is doing manually. You could pick a generic company. You could actually use a case study, use a company that somebody's familiar with, perhaps, and say, I wish this company had this system. This, this bugs me or something. Uh, new or improved service, feature, service, uh, safety, security might be your concern. Who knows? I get a good grade in class. That's also probably a concern. So pick something that I'm going to like. The biggest concern. The biggest concern is a grade in the class? No. Oops. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Half my grades are posted already. I don't know if you've seen them yet in the EMS. I'm like halfway through it. <laughs> if you're concerned about your grade, you can see them. Have you seen yours yet? Yeah. I mean, you guys are in the software engineering now. That one isn't, the weekday software engineering is not updated yet. That one is probably going to be put in on Sunday. The weekend, the, weekend, the, week, the weekday. The weekend is in, actually. And it's not in? You don't see it? In the EMS? Were you the one that sent me the email? Somebody sent me an email like like five, like five before this class. I answered it. Um, you did. <laughs> one of the sections is in. The other one's not in. It's in the EMS. The weekends are the weekends supposed, but not the weekday is what I thought. We have been checking it like every time. I know you guys have been checking it daily. Yeah. Because I've been receiving emails daily about when are the grades going to be posted? When are the grades going to be posted? Uh huh. Have to check in advance. See, it says your final exam score. Oh no no no! Final exam score is not in there because the TAs didn't put them in, but the grades are in there. Actually, that will be updated by the admission department. Uh, no, I actually put them in no, the yeah, EMS. Huh? Oh, no, no, it won't show up on a transcript yet because after. You guys could build. Here's some, somebody's sample project. You could build a fix to the system. After I put them into the EMS, there's another system that they take these printouts and they put it into another system, completely different, that shows up on your transcript. Why don't we have one system? We have two, two separate systems that do it. The system that I put them in is the EMS, which is what you should see them in the EMS. It's not going to show up on your transcript yet. In EMS, also, I mean, there are there are um, there is one grade section. There is one the one that you said that you'll be getting your marks here. I mean, we saw in two parts, but we didn't see. It. I believe that there must be a bug. <laughs> Trust me, I have been working with bugs the last weekend, last week. I can't tell you how many times I ran across problems. It's a work in progress. They're still working on it. It is possible that I put them in, but you can't see them. And it's possible that I actually graded some of your work, and you can't see the grades. Because after I put in like 150 or so, you know, it says screen one, screen two, and you click on the, t oh, for me, in my interface. And then I waited, and then I said save. It only saved the current page, not the previous ones. 
So like everyone passed L or M in the alphabet, got their grades in, and the other ones they didn't, pass, they didn't go in. For like two assignments out of the Java class. The software engineering one, I believe all of them went in, because I learned that, I did the software engineering one later, and then I learned the trick, and I'm like, oh, you have to press save after each page. <laughs> anyway, let me wrap this up so we can take a break and we can talk about all these problems um, off the record. <laughs> so, <laughs> I keep forgetting I'm recording this. All right. <laughs> so, resources. Okay, let's, let's close up so we can take a mini break. Uh, what do I got here? Resources. So potential benefits of the project research, well, you got you have to work with yourselves, three to five people in your groups. In fact, actually, at this break, you can start talking to each other, perhaps. We'll take like a 10 or 15 or so, and you can discuss amongst yourselves who wants to work with who, if possible. Um, how many hours per week do you get? You know, how much time allocation do you want to do? Maybe you just decide to work on it on your own. Who knows? Equipment, software, you don't really need anything for this course, actually. Microsoft Word is about all you need because you're going to be writing up Word documents. You don't need software tools. You don't have to work with people who have software engineering experience. In fact, if you don't, it's probably better. Obstacles. And most of the obstacles you're going to run into is the startup time. Forming your groups. So you guys are lucky because you only meet here three times. Which means you're going to be productive this week and you're going to form your groups. <laughs> Hopefully. So at least after this weekend, you have a group. The weekday students are going to wait till last week of class. <laughs> They're going to start forming their groups. Uh, business considerations, you don't really have any. Uh, maybe it's too ambiguous. Changing circumstances, somebody dropping the class, somebody adding the class. What you're looking at is essentially and what you're going to be doing is leveraging everything and minimizing your risk. So mostly you're going to pick people that you're familiar with worked with before, maybe, or you know personally. And you're going to have several different target levels of functionality, hopefully, that you're going to come up with in your description. you say, well, I'm going to build a system. Eh, these are the must-have features. This is desirable. This is the, uh, if we have time. You're going to leverage everything according to your time and abilities. And you're going to follow, hopefully, a visible software process, the waterfall model that we're looking at. And I'm going to have these deliverables, and you're going to actually produce the deliverables among your teams, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully I have good communication with the team and with me, hopefully. And then at the end, you're going to be looking at what I started off this lecture with. A little quote here, good processes lead to good software, good processes reduce risk. Because what we're doing is hopefully reducing the risk. So. What do you need for your topic selection? For those of you who came in late, because I'm going to give you a little bit of time, actually, few minutes to talk amongst yourselves and form your teams. I need an email message or a piece of paper or something and we're going to put, as soon as the EMS gets up with the class, we're going to put a little thing in there for your project topics and team members where everybody can upload it and or, you know, basically, and it's going to be a Word file. So everybody will be uploading a copy of everything their team is working on per individual. Because each individual will have their own EMS account, and we have four individuals working on the same team. So rather than having to line you all up, every person will upload everything themselves, even though you're working in a team. A lot of du duplicate uploads, that's what I'm saying. However, it's necessary because of the environment. But what are you going to put together at the beginning is what you're going to do is pick a name for yourself, you know, Acme Inc. or something. Hand in a sheet or upload it to the EMS is not a graded assignment. So you could send me an email message, which I would actually prefer, that says, Bob, Joe, and Mary are all working together on a team, and it's called Acme Inc. And we're going to build the next thing. Each group needs to submit a project topic. And it's an informal write-up that describes what the team's going to build. We're going to build an upgrade to the EMS system so that it prints out transcript information. And it's integrated in with the university registration system, so everything is synced completely. Nice. And sure enough, so that everybody reads it, well, I'm just going to be the only one reading it. And long enough so it includes important details. So you don't have to be verbose with it. It's not a written assignment. It's not a graded assignment. It's, it's, it's very casual. But it's a great exercise to jumpstart your team. I have found that the teams that do that end up producing successful projects. The teams that don't do this and wait until the very last week of class, oh, teams? Forget it. Too much work to do, you're never going to do it, you're going to end up doing it on your own. That's what I'm saying. It's better to start out with a team. So, why don't we do that now? So I'm going to stop my video.